Hello and welcome to Socialism, the weekly Marxist analysis podcast from the Socialist Party. France is in revolt. A chaotic but determined and courageous street movement has forced Emmanuel Macron, so-called President of the Rich, into retreat. The mass tide of the Gilets Jaunes has bloodied capitalism's nose in France. But is its lack of leaders a strength or a weakness? Can the movement be sustained? How can it achieve victory? Socialist Party members have just returned from France, helping our sister party, Gauche Révolutionnaire, taking part in the mass movement. Here's the latest. Over to Sarah Rack. Okay, I'm here today with uh, two guests this week for the first time. So I've got both Claire Doyle from the Committee for Workers International. Hi, Claire. Hello. And Theo Sharif, who's the National Chair of Socialist Students and has just recently uh, been on a trip to France. Um, and that's because this week we're going to be discussing the Gilets Jaunes movement. Apologies for my French accent. Um, <laughs> so, okay, to start with maybe Theo, mm. um, we like to start these discussions with why are we having this discussion? So why do you think <laughs> that uh, here in Britain it's important for people to think about this movement and what it means? Well, I think because it demonstrates what working class and young people can potentially win through mass action. So what started a little over a month ago now as um, protests against uh, a fuel tax uh, increase and just that one single issue has really acted as a bit of a lightning rod which has conducted the anger from different sections of French society um, against austerity, against uh, collapse in uh, living conditions, against attacks on uh, young French people's access to education, things like that, and has evolved into something a lot bigger. So about a week ago, the French president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, um, addressed the country in a national TV broadcast announcing that after the, uh, you know, the continuation of the Gilets Jaunes movement and the protests, that he would be scrapping um, a new tax on pensions, um, as well as confirming the reversal of the initial proposed fuel tax increase, and a hundred dollar, uh, sorry, a hundred euro uh, increase to uh, the minimum uh, wage. And I think it's important for us to discuss today because here in Britain we have Theresa May um, and the Tory party barely clinging on to power, but still we can see really there's a very very big. Uh, hesitancy by the leaders of the labour movement, the trade unions, but also Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell themselves to actually call action to force the Tories out of government and really to uh, match the willingness of both the working class and young people here in Britain to fight, but also the mood that working class and young people have demonstrated in France as well. Yes, yeah, so it's a, an answer to pessimism, isn't it, about what working class people are willing mm. to do. Think. What do you think, Claire? Yes, it is, but it, it's come. I mean, the situation in Britain and in France and in many countries now is that there's no party, no leadership that is really prepared to fight the governments in spite of the austerity and 10 years of crisis, really, probably <laughs> a few more to come. And this movement has not been actually called by anybody. Uh, it's a reaction, a real upsurge from below about the fuel tax as the last straw. And in French, I think they say the last drop in the cup of water before it overflows. And then it, it's co really caught the mood because, as you say, there's so much built-up anger and resentment, but it still hasn't found a, a clear voice. We can come on to that later, but <clears throat> the gilets jaunes are, are the people who are sort of least visible in society. They're, they've been impoverished, mostly in the countryside where petrol... Prices do, or diesel prices do affect their everyday life, going to work, getting their food, going to schools and things, and even social activities. So um, they were angry, and the, the gilets jaunes, which are which is more or less pronounced like that, <laughs> gilets jaunes, his pronunciation has got better every, every time I've been in France, um, but they, uh, they are high-vis jackets that everybody in France has in their car, and now these people are really high vis. They're high visibility, and although some people say it started with right, right wing and Le Pen, the, the you know the right wing nationalists, what was the Front National, 
Um, and therefore some of the left didn't want anything to do with it, and it was Pujardis sort of reacting to small businesses and things. Actually, I think they've been eclipsed. I don't know if you ever, if you saw any right-wingers on any of the activities that you were on, but it, it's drawn in the middle layers, um, all those who had a, a grievance, uh, uh, teachers, pensioners, old people saying, we want a revolution. Um, and, and then, crucially, the young people, because at first they weren't involved, although they had big grievances, because uh, last year, or as soon as, I think it was as soon as this government was in, they decided to restrict access to universities, which they've never had in France. I mean, many of the things that French people have enjoyed up to now have been because of the kind of revolutionary nature of French society. If they haven't been happy, they have had various mass movements and revolutions. Um, but the, the, the students were attacked, and I think Theo should say a bit more about their mood, but when they joined the... I think a hundred uh, schools came out at first, about two weeks ago, and once they joined, I think the government got uh, really frightened. Okay, so yeah, it seems like it's, um, it's a very wide-ranging movement, isn't it? That's what you've both kind of said. It's starting from a particular thing, but having caught that mood that we have said in you know country after country that it exists under the surface and when there's the opportunity for people to get involved in something and um, that they have so Theo what you've just been there what was mm. it like to be on the protest and who did you see kind of involved in it well I went on I arrived uh, last Tuesday and I um, I arrived back in uh, England on Sunday and there was pretty much a demonstration or a mobilization every day that I was uh, there but I think that just taking, for example, uh, the day I arrived on Tuesday, there was a youth day of action. Um, around about, I'd say, a thousand school and college students gathered in uh, the centre of uh, Paris. And I'd say what this protest and actually what all of the different demonstrations and protests that I saw uh, were like. It, they were incredibly determined, incredibly um, militant and determined despite the concessions that, um, that I previously referred to that Macron uh, made uh, the common chants on these marches are twos ensemble, twos ensemble, meaning you know all together, everyone out together. And um, Macron de mission, you know the demand for Macron uh, to um, resign. They're incredibly uh, popular uh, demands on the demonstrations, and I think, like uh, Claire said, you've got all different sections of society are now coming out onto the streets. The CGT which is, uh, I think, France's biggest trade union federation, called the Day of Action. Last um, Friday, there was a huge march, I'd say, of tens of thousands through uh, Paris. But like I said, I think a lot of these, Claire referred to it, the, the, the entry of young people, students, into the movement is really, really uh, fantastic. So that includes university and college students who have gripes against Macron. There are proposed education reforms at the moment. Um, where uh, uh, Macron's uh, 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 Minister of Education is suggesting that um, tuition fees for um, non-EU students be increased by over 16 times. Um, also legislation which would restrict um, and hamper the entry of working class college and school students into the university system. So very, very big uh, uh, gripes as well as general things like cuts and austerity in schools and uh, colleges. But on Tuesday, this uh, day of action, it was incredibly uh, lively and uh, determined. I mean, the march went on for hours and hours and just didn't stop. They just marched through the streets um, of Paris. Uh, students, very, very peaceful, but uh, uh, very, very um, energetic. They would stop at random points in the march and kneel and put their, he uh, their hands behind their heads, which was a reference to, um, in a small town uh, to the west of Paris uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, French police arrested around about 140 students, 150 students, I think, made them kneel, uh, put their uh, hands behind their uh, heads, essentially humiliating uh, the uh, uh, college students. And it sparked outrage on social media when that was uh, uh, broadcast. So they're, and they're also very, very aware, I think, especially the youth, of the role that the police are playing, that the riot police, the CRS, are playing, and they're incredibly defiant in the uh, face of that. And I think there were definitely echoes as well. I'll finish on this point. I think there were echoes of the Heat 68 movement when 10, 11 million workers came out onto the streets and uh, 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 in France um, on a general strike. For example, there were sections of college and 
school students uh, would start singing the Internationale um, on various uh, protests. And on Tuesday, at the end of uh, the demonstration, uh, when students were kettled by the CRS and also um, the army, the, the uh, gendarme, came out onto the streets, when the students were kettled, around about 150, 200 of them, of the students uh, formed a circle and uh, held a general assembly in the street to discuss on the megaphone, to discuss amongst themselves what they were going to do, the politics of the movement, things like that. So you can definitely see those sort of echoes of France 68, especially amongst the youth, I think, um, within the movement itself. So it's very exciting. So Claire, you mentioned um, the government being scared, particularly when the youth got involved. And Theo's just given a kind of another side, though, of the government's response, which is a kind of offensive one of sending state forces out against the, the demonstrations. What do you think about the yeah the, the response from the government and the state to the protests? Well, Theo actually alluded to an event long before he was born <laughs> that I remember well. And I've written about it. Um, which was the massive general strike of um, May in 1968. And um, people think everything is different these days, but I really thought, looking at what was happening over the last few weeks, you couldn't rule out a development of that kind. The trade unions weren't very involved. The CGT that you mentioned got pushed to call some days of action, which they do around this time of year anyway. It's a bit of a kind of routine thing. Um, but what happened to the students when they were seen to be humiliated like that, treated like that, uh, all over the world, actually, through social media, which you didn't have in 1968, I thought a spark like that could get people so angry that they demand that the unions take action, and it could develop like in 68, because in 1968 it wasn't an official call from the trade union movement. But, um, but I was thinking about... Um, the way a ruling class, when it's in difficulties, the way it veers between concession and repression, and the first instinct of de Gaulle and of Macron, this president of the rich who thinks he's Jupiter or Napoleon or something, you know, he is to mobilise the forces of the state, who are usually supposed to be quite loyal to the president, but they've been cut, they're, they're being stretched. But so he sent in the police and the riot police, and of course there's always people at the end uh, of a demonstration. In France, there are always casseurs, they're called, or the black bloc who go and smash up some windows. Um, and so that gets the publicity internationally. But, but when people were asked, what do you think about this violence? Said, well, well, I wouldn't do it myself, but um, I quite, it, it does seem to get results because they smashed up luxury, um, luxury shop windows, which then I think got boarded up by the time you got there. They were boarded up and and even the shopkeepers said they supported the Gilets Jaunes. Some of them said, commented. But so the, there was the repression, which can backfire, and, the, and there was concession, because Macron obviously, obviously felt there was a big, a big message for him that he had to change his policies because, as you say, it was uh, Macron uh, dégage or démission. You've been running various words for that same message, which is to get rid of the president, um, and his popularity figures are, are still going down. He's the most unpopular president ever, I think, at this time of his of his reign. He's w worse than Hollande, who went before him. But that that's the problem. Um, he was seen as a new figure who was going to do things differently, and he's ended up doing them the same as any kind of representative of the capitalist class, and they are very rich, and he has given them tax concessions. He's made um, a concession in relation to the fuel tax, and then um, he's made more concessions, which, as this article in The Economist says, he made from behind. He, he might, this is The Economist say, he might have been more persuasive had he not recorded his speech in the grandest room in the Elysee Palace, sitting behind a gilded desk. So he gave a big, a big um, sort of list of reforms that, that Theo has already mentioned, but um, then people were interviewed, and they said, yeah, well, that's good, but, you know, we want more. But uh, it's like the appetite is increasing with the eating, and I think it's not over yet. I think also, as well, it's worth mentioning that, I mean, just on how, you know, Macron and uh, the government has reacted to the protests, 
I think that they always expected, really, that the uh, that they would be unpopular. I mean, the comrades in um, our comrades in France, who are in Gauche Revolutionnaire, which is the sister organisation of the Socialist Party in France, told me that one of the first things that Macron did when he was elected was to buy and stock up on tear gas canisters. And that was because they were acutely aware of the fact that his programme was massively unpopular and really that the only reason he ever became the president was because the alternative in the voting was uh, the National Front and uh, Marine Le Pen. But I think also, in terms of the state response, I think you can see it now increasingly uh, unifying young people and students on the one hand and uh, the Gillette Jean movement on the other. I mean, I referenced before the... uh, sort of the, the, the staging of the arrests where the students get on their knees and put their hands behind their uh, heads, which is a really, really common feature of um, the youth protests. But on Saturday, um, last Saturday, uh, when the Gillette Jean were marching in Paris at Opera Square, thousands of them, um, it was reported on social media, of the Gillette Jean themselves were doing the same thing. They got down on their knees and put their hands behind their heads. And it was a bit of a solidarity gesture, I think, towards what uh, the youth have been going through. And I think just the hatred of how aggressive and intimidating um, and repressive the uh, CRS, the police are, that is really unifying uh, different people, uh, different sections in this uh, movement, I think. So in terms of what what the movement is for, what it's uh, fighting for, because we've kind of referenced that it's drawn in um, a lot of different layers of society who may be hanging to it, uh, fighting on, on different kinds of demands. Uh, and both of you have um, referenced the, the calls for Macron to resign, to be gone as kind of a, a key feature of the, uh, of the movement. So I suppose start with you, Theo, from being there and talking to people. What do you think is the, are the kind of main things that people are looking to achieve from taking part? Well, I think, like you said, what's clear is the main thing that is uh, getting people out to the streets is their hatred of Macron. So it's Macron de gage, Macron de mission. You hear that everywhere um, in the protests when you're uh, there. Different ways of uh, uh, demanding him to resign. Like I said, he has an incredibly unpopular program. He's perceived as being the president of uh, the rich. As Claire said, he's, comp- he's compared himself to Jupiter and uh, Napoleon on uh, numerous uh, uh, occasions, and he just really embodies, I think, to a lot of people, this arrogance of the mega-rich in France, the ruling class, and the uh, the capitalist class. Macron once said that all young people, all students and young workers, should all aspire to be entrepreneurs, millionaires, capitalists, venture capitalists, this kind of thing. And I think that just totally flies in the face of what people's like everyday experiences are, you know? with, like I said, the cuts to education, unemployment, cuts to living standards, homelessness, all of these uh, uh, things. So that is the main demand. That is what people in the immediate want to achieve and think the movement can achieve, rightly, that they can force Macron uh, out. The main slogan that our sister organisation, Gauche Revolutionaire, has been putting on the leaflets, Macron Degage, is incredibly popular um, at the various uh, youth mobilisations and in the Gillette Jean protests um, themselves. They're really enthusiastically taken up um, by people. But I think there is also a little bit of confusion in the movement as well um, in terms of the discussion on, you know, if we can get rid of Macron, and I think a lot of people believe that that is within the grasp of the movement. What next? So what replaces him? What positive program um, is the movement fighting for in order to uh, uh, replace Macron? What government would uh, replace him? I mean, for example, there's even discussion, and I don't think it, it, it's not widespread, but there are some people, for example, who would raise the question of a popular referendum on Macron's government as opposed to just going for, you know, kicking him out and getting rid of him. But I would say that this is a consequence, really, of the hesitancy of the leaderships of the big trade unions, Solidaire, CGT, to properly weigh in and decisively uh, enter the struggle, which, you know, we would say would clearly tip the balance of forces in the favour of working class um, and young people. What do you think, Claire? I think, as Theo said, there are a lot of discontented layers in society, and even before, 
this explosion <coughs> of anger, uh, which has involved, I think, it must have involved millions overall, if you count up people who've been on the demonstrations and on the blockades, and people who've never been involved in demonstrations before, um, ever. But then uh, there have been a lot of strikes, small strikes, in various areas, including at the refineries, there have been um, strikes recently at the oil refineries, there have been the railway strikes, there have been other strikes, but they've been sort of isolated and not really uh, developing into one um, big organised working class movement or, or movement of the workers. But it's had a huge effect and it probably, one of its weaknesses and one of its strengths is that it doesn't seem to have a leadership. It's been sort of organised on <coughs> social media. People have gone out and are very, you know, very resilient, staying on these blockades and um, um, waving people through, getting support from all the public, and then stopping the lorries, letting them through. I think you probably didn't see the blockades because you were in Paris, but all these stories, they, they stopped them for two minutes. They've done these effective things, but they, it spread like wildfire this uh, movement all over France and sort of a little bit of an anti-Paris, privileged Paris people feeling. Um, but it also makes it a bit difficult to stop. And once this appetite has increased, and I mentioned some of the other demands that they've put forward, um, who do you then settle with? And it seems they, they come up with more some more reforms, which they did within days they come up with this last a lot of reforms that you've mentioned, um, the, 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 the demonstrators haven't left the roads. I think, I think it will die down now over the Christmas holiday. Um, I think that uh, we'll come on to Mélenchon later, but he spoke about Act 5. Last Saturday was sort of Act 5 because it was the fifth Saturday of the um, demonstrations in, in the cities in Paris. But then we'd probably go on to sort of round two of the big fight um, immediately in the new year, I think. But the, it's, um, there isn't any leadership, but somehow they've got a, a very big and comprehensive program. Um, I won't read it all out, but it includes a basic, um, a 40% increase in the basic pension and social welfare programs, which have been cut, as you've said, which is which for France it really has. It's one of the biggest public spenders. France is one of the biggest public spending countries in the world, actually, but um, they've, they've been cutting back. Now, housing, 5 million rent-controlled housing units. They talk about reform of the banks, and they do talk about reversing all the privatisations that have been done in the recent period. Um, and we'd say, you know, implement that kind of program, that, uh, conduct a fight to the end. Um, they, they talk about how justice should be organised, how, how they should organise to protect the environment. They say they wanted to put this tax on um, to stop people using diesel fuel, but they haven't been developing um, environmentally friendly ways of um, producing goods or doing agriculture or even of travel. Um, so that's in their program. Geopolitical, get out of NATO, um, sort out uh, Francophone Africa, you know, stop the pillaging and interfering politically and militarily in Africa. So it's a very wide-ranging program that they put forward. Um, whether they stick to it, you know, I don't... I, I can't see it going on forever until they've achieved all of these things, but I can see it continuing for a while. Um, because they feel they've got the strength. Uh, but they haven't yet got the full involvement of the trade union movement or the workers from below, which can come, as I said, it can be sparked by, you know, by one action in one factory it can spread, as it did in France 68. But it, as yet it doesn't involve the mass of the working class, who are anyway very low trade union membership, but very high sort of volatility and propensity to, to strike. Um, but the, just one other feature is that a lot of the people on the, dem on the demonstrations and on the block blockages, blockading the roads and occupying the payage, the toll booths, are um, people who have regarded themselves as middle class up until now, living fairly comfortably, but have seen their, their own living standards really declining. I mean, they had to make choices, uh, gradually 
going down, being driven down in a way that Marx and Engels described it in the Communist Manifesto mm. in 1848, actually. And they will, if the working class then moves, they will adopt the same sort of uh, methods as the working class and join in, you know, and back um, a mass general strike. I think our comrades are calling for the unions to actually name and day to get everybody yeah. out on one day. A general strike, which is complicated in France because you all have to have assemblies and so on. But we say, yeah, everybody should have assemblies um, in the factories, in the neighborhoods, in the cities, in the schools, and then link up on a local basis, and then on a regional basis, and then on a national basis. And as we said in relation to 68, those um, organs of struggle or bodies of struggle could actually, with a clear leadership, if people knew what they were doing, which is essential for carry through a successful revolutionary change in society, that, that could they could change from being the organs of struggle to being the organs of government, actually. Mm. And pe you know, workers and people's government. Workers and poor people's government. It maybe sounds old-fashioned, but it's the only way to sort things out. Um, just briefly to go back to something you mentioned in the introduction, Claire, um, which is uh, it has been highlighted that initially there was some intervention by the far right into the movement. In relation to how it began and the support of, of the National Front, or even Le Pen um, uh, saying she, she was uh, supporting it and agreeing with it, um, that she, people have voted for her and her party and supported her because she's against against this government, but also against austerity, and she's expressing the frustrations of the of the impoverished, of the unemployed, of whom there are a large number of unemployed and precarious workers in France. Um, as they say in French, faute d'autre chose, in the absence of something else. Um, and as I said, the people on these blockages, some did vote for the FN, and now they're thinking they shouldn't have done. Uh, others voted for the left. Some voted for Macron, thinking he was a new kid on the block and he might sort something out. Um, and some, many didn't vote at all and, uh, or, or went to the polling booths and voted black. Um, and I think that uh, with a clear call along on socialist policies that um, I've mentioned, which is really expanding on this programme and talking more about public ownership of the major means of production, distribution and exchange, um, that that would cut across support for the far right, you know, frustrated sort of support for the far right. And also if there's a clear policy, if there's more for everybody, then we don't have to have anti-immigrant um, um, policies and slogans, which they, they don't haven't featured in this movement at all. Um, but I think um, it needs a clear, clear, left alternative. Then on the left, uh, what has been the kind of role of the organised left, and particularly we've referenced a couple of times, of uh, Mélenchon? This Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who was in the Socialist Party, and he was even a minister in the Socialist Party a few years ago, a few years ago, has, has become very popular as the leader of a, a movement called France Insoumise, which means France Unbowed, you know, unsubmitting, um, which was a movement and now is supposed to be more of a party. But it's like in many, many countries, it's not structured, and they're sort of still continuing to to uh, uh, express this anti-party feeling that is that we've seen in uh, Spain. We've seen it uh, well in in a number of countries. Particularly, I'm thinking of Podemos, and in and in Italy, where even a kind of mixed left and right populist organization, the Five Star, um, they they're all sort of they make decisions online, and they don't have a structure, and it's difficult to become a member. It means that it means that the leaders of the movement, like Mélenchon, can avoid being held to account, and he can come out with some very uh, quite inspiring slogans and ideas, like he talks about a citizen's revolution, 
But he talks about reorganizing the banks, a bit like the Gilets Jaunes, rather than nationalizing the banks, which is very important in France. But nevertheless, in the last election, in the presidential election, um, he wasn't the only left candidate, but he got more than 7 million votes in the first round. And um, he could have... He could have got through to the second round if all the other sort of lefts, including what was left of the of the so-called Socialist Party in France, if they had backed him as the only candidate, he could have been in the second round, and he could even have won the second round because a lot of, a lot of people voted for Macron to keep Le Pen out, and he could have won it. But so our sister comrades, sister and brother comrades in France, um, they work alongside that movement, the France Insoumise. Um, they've, uh, one or two of them have been candidates in the elections and are sort of campaigning for a structure where decisions can be made and a real lead can be, can be given. I mean, Mélenchon has referred to the right to, the right to insurrection, which, is, which was a slogan of the revolution in 1789. Um, and he's talked about this Act Act 5 and we have to continue the struggle. But, you know, we would argue that he has to take up really what our programme is and Theo is going to tell you what outcome is the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I think in terms of what our sister organisation is doing um, in France at the moment, I think it's worth saying that, firstly, you know, we're not just cheerleaders of the movement. You know, we have comrades who are out on... As many protests, demonstrations, barricades um, in the streets, outside the schools and colleges uh, as possible, really, you know, standing shoulder to shoulder with workers and youth who are uh, fighting to get rid um, of Macron. But also that we're not just turning up passively on these various mobilisations, um, but, you know, we are advancing a set of ideas within the movement and... Um, to, in our view, you know, take the situation uh, forward to both sort of escalate the struggle, but also to uh, to see it succeed. So, you know, for example, we call for the uh, creation of general assemblies in the various workplaces, offices, but also schools and colleges to discuss not only democratically a uh, strategy for how to take the movement forwards because we've got to bear in mind as well I think that this has been going on for quite a while now it's five weeks and we saw on Saturday that it wasn't mass it wasn't hugely smaller but it was a bit smaller the Gillette Jean protest last Saturday was a little bit smaller than what we've seen before so it's important we think to discuss democratically through these general assemblies you know and um, what the stra- uh, how do we carry on building the movement, how do we uh, escalate it, but also to use these structures to actually discuss what the programme of the movement should be, what the demands of the movement should be, and what it is putting forward um, in a positive sense as an alternative to what we have currently under uh, uh, Macron, which, the, you know, the, as, as the comrades in Gauche Revolutionaire and what we would say, we think could include all of the you know progressive demands which have already been put forward by the Gillette Jean movement, the 42-point programme which Claire uh, referred uh, to, but also to go further than that, you know, not just to talk about reforming various banks and institutions, but to actually nationalise the banks, the finance houses, but also the commanding heights of the French economy, which control the French economy, to nationalise those elements under the democratic control and management of working class um, and uh, uh, young people um, in order to democratically uh, organise you know, all of these resources uh, which exist in uh, French uh, uh, society. And in this way, actually, I think that that would be perfect for the movement because, like Claire said, these general assemblies, these organisations in the offices, the workplaces, the schools, at, at this point in time would be sort of organs of struggle to hash out, discuss and debate what the movement needs strategically, what its programme is, but eventually could start to be seen in the eyes of all the various different sort of discontented sections of French society as the alternative to Macron's government, you know, and that would be the basis of really a challenge for power, for, for building a revolutionary movement, not only against Macron, but against 
French capitalism, but also what we're calling for, and we've referred to it already in this discussion, but is for the leadership of the trade unions to pull the organised working class into this struggle, because unfortunately, as of yet, they haven't uh, uh, done that, and it, it shows in the... Uh, it shows in the movement, but I think that definitely, you know, there's there's all sorts of different, you know, there's lots and lots of localised strikes all across France. I mean, on Wednesday when I was there, we visited um, a picket line at uh, one of the Hyatt hotels um, in uh, central Paris. There are workers there who have been striking for three months nearly against um, outsourcing uh, of work, low pay. On the CGT Day of Action, um, we met some uh, postal workers uh, who have been on strike, I think, if I remember correctly, since the end of March. So there are really, really determined struggles of French workers going on right now, you know, not only across Paris, but all across uh, uh, the country. And that determination to fight um, exists, but, you know, it needs to be reflected, we would say, by the leaderships of the CGT, Solidaire, the other big trade union leaders and to pull the organised working class into this battle and we think on that basis um, the movement can grow, the movement can carry on fighting and uh, you know the, 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 the prospect of kicking out Macron um, is achievable. Yeah and one other thing, just the two things, one is I think our, our sister brother comrades in Rouen have been on picket lines of the uh, dock workers there who are having their workforce contracted, um, so they're fighting. I mean, they never stop fighting in France, really. It's just it doesn't always end up with sort of days and days of general strike action as it did a couple of years ago against the labour law. But if, if um, a really socialist government does come to power out of a movement that's going to grow, you know, in the, in the new year, then in the country of revolution, it just wouldn't stop in France. You can see by the enthusiasm of people in Britain, people who say, oh, if only we could do that here, as we started this particular uh, discussion, uh, saying people are sort of envious that the traditions of the French, they do it, don't they? They get out onto the streets. I remember 50 years ago in 68 outside the um, City Hall in London, women from the East End on... Uh, what would, discussing organising a red strike and they saw the front page of what was called Militant saying uh, about the, the French Revolution has begun and they were saying that's what we need here. So as soon as something really broke in France it would spread and you can see already there have been demonstrations in Brussels against their government uh, carrying through austerity measures and um, the, uh, the dictator Sisi in Egypt has banned the sale of yellow jackets because so afraid that if they put on these yellow jackets they'll become revolutionary and you might have another sort of Arab Spring and it is anniversary in January of what happened in uh, Tunisia you know when there was a, a big revolutionary upsurge so especially with social media I think it would spread like wildfire across Europe uh, across the home of the, of the original so successful, the only successful socialist revolution in Russia, China, and beyond, and we could be living in a world where we're building socialism quite soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so that's uh, a good point to finish on, and we'll obviously have to keep a, a watching brief on it all in the new year. So thanks very much both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So, you can head over to our website for the latest updates and also read the episode notes at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. Leave us a five-star review and click subscribe to get new episodes straight to your device and email us any questions for Claire or Theo or suggestions for future episodes to socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk.